Basically, so what I'm saying to you is the concept of God is like it's unlike his creation. So therefore, we reject the concept that man can be God. So in our religion, our understanding, Jesus is a great and mighty prophet of God, great and mighty messenger of God. If, we read, if you read the New Testament particularly, and I, I've read it in reasonable, reasonably, that's the message I get from it. I don't go away thinking, well, you know what, he's God, or a second person of the Trinity. Yeah. But, and then when, when we observe the explicit statements of him within the New Testament, he makes explicitly to claim that he's a prophet. It's amazing actually when you read it. Mark chapter 6 verse 4, Matthew chapter 21 verse 11, he expressly states that I'm a prophet. Okay, then when you look at other terminology such as what does the term son of God mean in the Bible? A term commonly misused in, in Christendom to give an, 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 an understanding or an equivocation that that is the second person of the Trinity. However, the term in itself simply means one who represents God. Matthew chapter 5 verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the sons of God. Luke chapter 3 verse 38, Adam is a son of God. So the repetition of this particular term is one who represents God. Now notice the subtle distinction between the term Son of God and God the Son. Very subtle, but it's there. So God the Son is, is essentially the second person of the Holy Trinity, which is not mentioned of Jesus or anyone else for that matter in the Bible. These were later additions and the various councils of Christendom in the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople in the 4th and 5th century, where that Trinity concept became augmented in terms of a final uh, decree given due to certain um, mitigating influences. However, within the first century of Christianity, these terms which were commonly used, Son of God was one who represents God. God the Son was much later invention. So when we understand and derive that point, do you know the Dead Sea Scrolls found in 1945? These titles such as Son of God, the Messiah, Prophet, these are all interchangeable titles to each other because what the title Son of God essentially means is those who represent God so they, that would come under the remit also of um, uh, messengers. First of all, I hope I'm being polite and respectful to you as, as we... Uh, I'm just trying to, for you to understand where I'm coming from so that we can so I understand your um, understanding of Joseph Smith and so forth so I've got a reasonable uh, understanding of that. Um, so again, we go back to that centrality of the message that there's only one God and again that these terms are ones who represent God. Yeah. How do you see that? I mean, in your view, what is your understanding of what I've explained? Like a one supreme being, unlike his creation, who is far beyond us, but nearest, nearer to us. He observes everything we do in every intricate detail, but he's not part of the creation because the moment you give God um, um, characteristics within creation, then that ceases to be God. He can have certain attributes of himself which he invokes on us. So God can, for example, be happy with people. He can become angry with people. But these are certain attributes which he shares. However, it's never to the equivocation of then God being man, if you see what I mean. The Bible testifies itself that God is not a man. Hosea 11.9, Numbers 23.19. So this is very fundamental to what we believe, you see. And hence, when we look at the New Testament, when I see it, I don't, it doesn't hit out to me that Jesus is God, for example. It doesn't strike me. And even when you look at the other passages which could possibly construe that he is claiming to be God, I've always observed when you apply the context of whichever passage you wish to take, it's telling us to the contrary. Are you following what I'm saying to you? So for example, if you could bring any verse up which you believe highlights Jesus is God, then I'd like to hear that. I mean, obviously you want to share, uh, you know, because obviously you have a slightly different term understanding from main trim Christians yeah, upon, we do. upon your um, uh, your founder Joseph Smith so I don't want it to be a monologue you can obviously uh, come in and please um, uh, speak as well whenever you wish to but what do you think about this concept of God which I've mentioned, made mention of, of, of it there to are you. elements of it we agree with that he's, he's beyond our comprehension or what we can try to understand but that's what, what we share is is that we learn so much about God and his true nature through Jesus Christ yeah. Yeah. and through prophets who speak for him like you mentioned Joseph Smith we've learned a lot about the nature of God through his chosen servants through the prophets so that's an excellent point you've made the, the, the former point you made that Christ being a form of a conduit between God and mankind I'd accept that yeah it's just how we express Precisely. That connection, that so this is where the, the matter becomes somewhat cloudy.
Yeah. So what we then observe is when you apply the context of such a term that you've made you know, then it's just as in the form of representation. Because you know those New Testament writers, they weren't Trinitarian in nature. And neither were they even Binitarian. However, they were those who elevated Christ up to an exalted being through whom God did many great wonders and signs. So it was like a slight, because don't forget, the New Testament was written in Greek. So for them to conceptualize an unseen God was very difficult, as you can possibly uh, uh, understand. But what then happened was that they, it, they used certain influences due to the Jews who went to the Hellenistic world at that particular time, like yeah. places like Cyprus, Turkey, Greek, uh, Greece and Asia Minor, these types of places. So when they went as such, they introduced certain um, understandings within that. So for example, a, a very eminent um, Christian, uh, sorry, yeah, a, a theologian, a Jewish theologian and historian, Philo of Alexandria. You know the writer of Gospel of John? He was a contemporary because Philo of Alexandria was about, wrote his works about 70 to 80 years before um, John's Gospel was written. And the writer of John's Gospel was influenced much by Philo of Alexandria who then viewed Moses like a second God to, um, uh, to, to God like in Exodus 7 1 where it says um, that um, where God says that I have made you a God to Pharaoh. So the writer was influenced by that if you see what I mean and hence he brought that understanding in the Gospel of John. When we read the prologue of John 1 1 in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. This was the eulogy of these people who thought that because Moses is referred to as God in Exodus 7.1, hence we can use this language of Jesus as well. And this is the idea which was then initiated within the, uh, the, the first part of the New Testament. Are you following what I'm saying to you? So obviously from John 1.1, it's not the actual express, express words of God, but rather um, they are referred to as um, the prologue to John's Gospel. The par it's a parenthesis. I'm sure you're aware of what the term parenthesis is. I don't mean to condescend you, I'm just speaking generally. People may not be aware, that's why I'm saying it. So within that pretext, as I said, when we read the New Testament in generality, we come to a certain understanding that he never claims to be God, number one. And then what, what, what does the term actually God mean in the Bible? They're used for many people ubiquitously, those who represent God, or people who have a high disposition. Even Satan is known as a god in, in Corinthians as well. So those who carry, carry a particular uh, position within the world or influence, they are hence given these titles. And you see this in a repetitive uh, basis. So God can be referred to as Elohim. It can also be referred to as for individuals. The Lord, the title, um, can also be referred to God, but also to individuals as well. Are, are you following what I'm saying to you? Yeah. So this is where the, 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 the water becomes somewhat muddy. So I'd invite you, maybe, as uh, have you got a copy of the Quran? No. I'll, I'll give you a free copy in English if you would like. No, I'm good. Thank you're you. good. I'm sure you are. I'm sure you're very strong in whatever you believe. But I'm just giving you a, an overview of it makes, and this is what we believe that was the prevailing um, message of the prophets within the Old and New Testament. They all came to bringing people back to worshiping God, often to transgressing communities, often to communities who had, you know, gone astray. And, or those communities which needed uh, God's word to empower them, to bring them back to worshipping God and God alone. And this is what we see of Christ in the, in the, in the New Testament. He says um, that I have not come to do my will, but the will of God who has sent me. Of my own free will I can do nothing. So what we're, obser what we're, obser what we're trying to basically say to, say to you is that is God is one supreme, the Islamic concept is beautiful. It, it, there's a touchstone in the Islamic theology, which is towards the latter part of the Quran, where Allah says that he is one, he begets not, neither is he begotten, and there is nothing like upon to him. Nothing like upon to him. And that is the very definition of a creator. Islam means submission to the will of God. You attain peace by submitting your will. So quite oddly for many people, Muslims will claim that Jesus was a Muslim, or Moses was a Muslim, or Abraham was a Muslim. And you would you know, probably think that's a very odd thing to say, who, people who came you know, from, nominally from the children of Israel, but Abraham, for example, what was he? he, he there was no Judaism at that time. There was no, so we would say he was a submitter to the will of God. Hence, that makes you a Muslim. You see, all the other world's religions, Christianity, Christ, they follow uh, from the term Christ. Judaism from the land of, uh, from the tribe of Judah, the land of Judea. Hinduism from the Indus uh, Valley in India. 
They all take their names from either geographical areas or from the major protagonists. Whereas Islam in itself is quite unique. The very word means submission to the will of God. So hence we say Adam would have been a Muslim. Islam would have been there right at the beginning. But it was formalized and conceptualized within Islam with the advent of the Prophet Muhammad upon the beast as God's final messenger to mankind who came amongst the uh, pagan Arab community to bring them back to worshipping God. Those who had transgressed, they had some sort of understanding of a divine creator, but they then incorporated much imagery to that creator. And so when he came, he came as a, uh, the Quran states, as a mercy to the whole world. He was a universal messenger for everyone. Whereas, for example, Christ would have been just for the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. He only came for a select people. He, in fact, he's, he very categorically states, go forth not to the Gentiles. So you're not even some, you only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he came for a very specific people to bring them back to worshipping God and away from the transgressions that they've fallen into. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. It does, doesn't it? So like I'm not here to like convert you or anything like that. You're very, I very much appreciate you for first of all listening. You're very kind in, in doing that as well. So, um, and like I said, I, mean, I do know a little bit about your faith as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, I say good, you know, oh, well, I wish you the best. But Thank think you. about perhaps what I've just said in terms of the centrality of God. I know you have some sort of understanding that God can also be incorporated as a dichotomy to the universe as well. Like there's a universe, there's God as well. There's certain strands of um, um, Mormons who do believe in that concept of God as well, that the universe is eternal, co-analogous to God. But what we say is no. God is the one supreme being who creates everything. So today in modern day science, we're, we understand that the universe came into uh, uh, existence some 13.8 billion years ago. And obviously if it come, come, come into existence, it needed a centrality. So hence, the universe cannot be a co-equivalent to God. He is the fundamental creator of everything. And that's the, that's, so when I started this conversation initially, I did say that Muslims, we like to think that we've got the very best concept of God. And that in itself is now predicated on the, the latter points that I've made to you. That it's not like his creation, beyond the creation. In the metaphysical realm which we cannot comprehend. As I speak to you, if I put my hand out towards you, we've got space, there's time, there's matter, there's so many substances. And that came as a result of the Big Bang or however you want to term it. Are you following me? But what that metaphysical state was is incomprehensible to us. However, it would have required by logic that he had an initiation. So that is what we say, which is the beautiful point I made for you about the Islamic theology. There is nothing like unto him. Incomprehensible in this sense. But the fundamental creator of all that exists. Nothing is co-equivalent to him. So nothing states, comes within the universe and is a proxy to God. Are you following what I'm saying to you? Yeah. Now these are later, pla these are, these are later platonic understandings, which were augmented in Greek philosophy. Yeah. Which it, and through the writing of Greek philosophers like Aristotle and Plato and these individuals. And they're the ones who incorporated this understanding of God's intellect, the mind, and, and so forth. And this is how this notion of the Trinity actually spread from those, from those um, um, philosophical um, meanderings, if you want to call it. But we go back to the worship of the one true God. That's really all, what I would like to share with you. If you want to say anything, please, I mean, you're very welcome to. We, we speak by way of invitation, so we just invite people to read the Book of Mormon. No, no absolutely. I mean, obviously, this is, a, this is a free world. We could do whatever we like. God says in the Quran, let there be no compulsion in religion, for exactly. truth stands out clearly from falsehood. So all we do is invite, we reason, lots of people take that reasoning. And then if you want to remain where you are, that's between you and your creator. Yeah. Good, good mouth. I really appreciate your time and listening to me. Thank you so much. Thank you so yeah. much. Take care. Right, what's your name? I'm Elder Crawford. Elder Crawford. Yeah, it's a nice, nice name. Elder Crawford. Which part of the states are you from? I'm from Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland. Okay, nice. Which, which part? You know, Belfast. Yep, of course. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, I don't know. But I haven't been there as such. But okay, I was just telling your friend, in fact, um, uh, about Islam and what he knows about it, what you know about it. I'm not here to pre, obviously you're here to do your stuff or whatever, but in terms of your understanding, what do you know about the religion? I know a bit, I know a bit, but I'm going to go now. We have indeed, yeah. So I don't want to give you the third degree either if you don't want me to. So um, anyway, I've enjoyed speaking to you guys and you. Take care of yourself. Take care. See you soon. Thank you.